They were the largest moving objects ever made by man. For 100 years or more, they ruled the North Atlantic. It was as if the finest hotels or the grandest country homes in the world had put to sea. Born in the minds of men named Brunel and Canard, they were propelled by the mightiest engines ever built. In time, they became powerful symbols of mighty nations on both sides of the Atlantic. They served in peace and war and carried millions upon millions of brave souls to a new life across the sea. Inside their colossal hulls, inventive architects created amazing interiors to cradle the rich and famous in seagoing luxury. Their names still evoke the elegance of their day. The largest, fastest, and most glorious ships of all time. Wonders of their age. Legends in their time. They were the great floating palaces of the North Atlantic. On the Bristol Channel, 100 miles west of London, the steamship Waverley begins another day of service. The Waverley is the last of her kind, the last seagoing paddle steamship in the world. Today, another group of curious passengers joins Captain David Neal and his dog, Pitch. Theirs will be a journey back in time, when ships like this first clouded the sky with the smoke of a fuel-burning engine and conquered the Atlantic with steam. Steam. Nothing more than the hot, wet exhaust of boiled water, channeled to push cylinders, pump shafts, and turn paddle wheels. Steam is what moves the Waverley at 18 knots. It was this kind of steamship, equipped with sails just in case, that first challenged the Atlantic, a madman's gamble, some call it, with common sense and conformity betting against its success. May 1819, the new American steamship Savannah heads east across the Atlantic. She departs with the pioneer's humble misgivings. The captain isn't certain how much coal to carry. Later he will learn that there wasn't enough room to store what he needed. Onlookers call her the steam coffin, and neither passengers nor cargo will risk a crossing in so unproven a contraption. Her owners hoped to promote Savannah in the first transatlantic crossing by steam, then sell her. In Europe, rumors say the ship has been designed to rescue Napoleon from exile in St. Helena. Twenty-six days later, off the Irish coast, a lookout sights smoke on the water. Authorities dispatch a cutter to rescue a ship on fire. What they find instead is the look of ships to come. But the world is not yet ready for the Savannah. No monarch, including the Tsar, no minister of war, no master of commerce is impressed. And so the Savannah returns home under sail to finish her life hauling the mail, her engines removed forever. Still, steam is here to stay.
East of Bristol, on England's southern coast, is Southampton. Home to ships for centuries, thousands of tons of cargo pass through the port daily. From these same docks, the Mayflower, a tiny ship barely 90 feet long, once set sail for the New World. She took 66 days to cross the Atlantic. Today, Southampton is best known for another ship, the Queen Elizabeth II. She crosses the Atlantic in five days and will leave this afternoon for New York with 1,100 passengers. An army of baggage handlers has spent the entire morning loading nearly 4,000 suitcases, garment bags, and steamer trunks. Her crew numbers a thousand men and women. The officers are well experienced. The captain has spent 41 years at sea, long enough to live through everything a man can encounter on the waves of the Atlantic. This will be the QE2's 998th voyage from England to the United States. On the ebb tide, the pilot will guide her down the river Solent out to the English Channel. From there, the captain will command her across the North Atlantic into New York Harbor to her berth in the Hudson. In a sequestered world like this, it's hard to imagine a time when bold pioneers first crossed the ocean in a steamship. The QE2 is a marvel of 20th century technology. Designed to accomplish what her passengers take for granted, crossing the Atlantic in comfort and safety. The QE2 came to sea in 1969, just months before man first walked on the moon. Her engineering reflects the era of the space age, although her origins date back to a distant past and another queen. It is 1837. Victoria sits on England's throne. Her coronation is lit by oil lamps. The foremost author of the day is Charles Dickens. Like his contemporaries, he writes with a quill sharpened with a penknife. Crossing the Atlantic by steam is considered as unlikely as reaching the moon. Yet one man is determined to do it. Isambard Kingdom Brunel. His railroads, tunnels and bridges already link Britain's major cities. Brunel's genius was in his civil engineering. It was in his bridging. The more you study the man, the more you realize that provided it didn't move, it was going to be OK. He was a complete disaster with anything that moved. But provided it was a great bridge, say, or a beautiful building, because in these things is artistry. Brunel's artistry still adorns England above the River Avon at the Clifton Bridge and at the Temple Meads Railway Station in Bristol. But it is what Brunel did to ships that changed the world. Brunel loved the big one. He wanted something big. 
Now, he designed a railway line from London to Bristol, 120 miles. But that wasn't enough. And there's a famous story of how a timid director, having obtained an Act of Parliament to build the railway, now wondered, was it not too long? And he said to Brunelli, is this not going to be too long, this railway? And Eisenbahn said, too long? Let's build a steamship and take it to New York. Like the railroad, he names his steamship the Great Western. She is the first vessel purposely built to cross the Atlantic and will be the fastest ship in the world. April 4, 1838. The Great Western leaves Bristol on the first westbound steam crossing of the Atlantic. On the same day, another ship, the Sirius, leaves Cork, Ireland. She is half the size and two-thirds the weight of the Great Western. The race to New York is on. For the winner, there will be fame and a rich contract to carry mail between England and America. But on the first day, a fire breaks out on the Great Western. The Sirius steams ahead. The Great Western almost sinks and Brunel is nearly killed. Fourteen days later, the Sirius arrives in New York. Rather than stop for coal, her crew has burned all of the ship's furniture. Twelve hours later, New York cheers the Great Western. Though both ships would share the fame, neither would have the fortune. That would fall to a 50-year-old Nova Scotia shipowner named Samuel Kennard. In London, Kennard bids 60,000 pounds for the Admiralty's mail contract and gets it. In turn, he establishes the world's first regularly scheduled transatlantic service. While Brunel reinvented ships, Kennard reinvented a business. The thing about Cunard is that he was a self-made man and a brilliant entrepreneur and businessman. He was the equivalent of Carnegie or Mellon or Onassis. He took calculated risks. He was terrific at making deals. He was terrific at networking. Uh, his landing of the Royal Mail contract across the Atlantic was purely down to the contacts he made, chatting people up at the right moment. This was his great strength. With the mail contract, Cunard goes to Glasgow to seek out Robert Napier, the foremost steamship designer of the day. True to his prudent Scots nature, he directs Napier to build a plain ship, preferring simple woodwork in the cabins to cut costs. On July 4, 1840, two years after the Great Western arrived in New York, Cunard steams west in a practically identical ship, the Britannia. At a top speed of eight knots, the 207-foot steamship with sails departs Liverpool. She carries 124 passengers, the mail, Samuel Cunard and his daughter Anne. At sea, Cunard urges the captain, above all else, bring the ship across safely. And secondly, make sure the crew goes easy on the rum. Twelve days later, Britannia reaches Halifax, safe and sound. The company Samuel Cunard once dreamed of has been born. Two years later, it will be famous because of a January gale. And a distinguished passenger, one Charles Dickens. Dickens, at the age of 30, was uh, the equivalent of a superstar today. He'd written Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickleby. He'd published The Old Curiosity Shop with Little Nell. And he decided to go to America on a Cunard ship. And he boards the Britannia for a horrendous crossing across the Atlantic. The first day out, they're caught in the gale. Dickens calls his cabin a hearse with windows. For 10 consecutive days, he is seasick. 
On deck, he observes a lifeboat, broken like a walnut shell. It was so awful that they had to chain the funnel down to stop it blowing away. All the passengers thought they were going to meet their end in it. Finally, the Britannia arrives in Boston with Dickens sick but safe. To honor Captain Samuel Woodruff, the man who saved their lives, Dickens and the other passengers present him with this silver wine set. The QE2 will have none of the difficulties encountered by Captain Woodruff on the Britannia. The difference between Captain Woodruff and me is that I've got a damn sight better idea where I am than he did, because we've got the state-of-the-art navigational systems. I've got a much bigger and a stronger ship than he has. Good evening. Welcome. Nice to see you this evening. Today, this last of the great ocean liners crosses the Atlantic in safety and luxury. From 1840 on, larger and larger ships will race from Europe to America and back again. What Samuel Cunard began will become the age of the floating palace. QE2 cruises effortlessly at just under 28 knots. In her wake is Bishop Rock, the westernmost outpost of the British Isles. She is one of the largest vessels on the sea. 963 feet long and 105 feet wide. Deep within the ship is the largest propulsion plant ever built for a merchant vessel. Her service speed is 28 knots. Her maximum is 32. Bridge ECR. ECR bridge. Yes, sir. Could you increase the power on the starboard shaft, please? Increase power on the starboard shaft. Will oh, do. The ship's nine diesel electric turbines drive two 350-ton electric motors. They are the largest electric motors on Earth. One gallon of fuel drives the QE2 less than 50 feet. Her nine engines, one always shut down for maintenance, consume 433 tons of diesel each day. 88% of that power is dedicated to one purpose, turning these 400-foot shafts. They rotate 144 times a minute and turn a pair of propellers, each 19 feet in diameter. As one historian said, it's as if New York's Waldorf Astoria were moving along Park Avenue at 40 miles an hour. The QE2 is fast because she is big. When it comes to speed on the water, size matters. The first passenger liners were conceived by England's master engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. His Great Western was huge and his second even larger. He called it Project Mammoth, and it would be the world's biggest ship. When backers wanted Mammoth to replicate his Great Western, already a model of success, Brunel refused. He had this wonderful charm. He could charm the birds off the trees, and that is how he got people to follow him. And of course, Brunel led from the front. If there was danger, he was in there and many people admired him. When he had finished, every detail had been changed. Even the name Mammoth became Great Britain. 
In building the Great Britain, Brunel proved that big ships move faster and use less coal than smaller ones because as tonnage increases by the cube, resistance increases only by the square. Today, the Great Britain rests in dry dock at Bristol, England, where she was built. Visitors explore the world's first iron ship and learn how Brunel achieved the unprecedented size required to carry enough coal to cross the ocean. Brunel also found iron hulls to be more buoyant than wood, free from rot, maintenance, fire, and vermin. What we've got is a chance to see the ship which really started the steam revolution. That's when people, after generations of exploration and wars, started a completely new culture of European emigration. And it was the steamship which powered that. And it's the Great Britain which started all that. It had the most powerful engine that was ever built. It had the screw propeller. And although screw propellers have been used before, it certainly hadn't been used on a ship of this size. She had a lot of other features, like these you know, masts which hinge at the base, the iron wire rigging, the propeller which is balanced in the middle so she's easy to control, and a whole load of features. In fact, we're still finding some of them as we go along today. Ironically, one of Brunel's most important innovations was an accident. It was the ship's bridge. The bridge was originally built so that the engineer could walk across the ship from one paddle wheel to another. But when Brunel dropped paddles in favor of a propeller, the first propeller to push a ship across the Atlantic, the bridge stayed. No ocean liner would ever be without one. In 1860, the Great Britain sails between Liverpool and New York. Her iron hull saves her when she runs aground off the Irish coast, but not from a fire that leaves her forsaken in the Falklands in 1886. Finally, in 1970, she is towed 8,000 miles to Bristol. A rally of public sentiment has brought her home. The ship came back as being very little more than an empty box, uh, but when we set to work on her, we found that uh, a lot of the fabric was very sound. And we reckoned that the best thing we could do was to make her look what she looked like in 1843 when she was first built, because that is the form in which she is most historically significant. They'd made this ship the biggest in the world, and in the process, they also wanted to make her the finest. They built in these two amazing saloons where people could live the sort of civilized life which they expected to live on shore and which previously had not been available to them at sea. Today the Great Britain's public rooms are beautifully restored. The original brochure promised that women need not pass in negligee through public rooms to go to bed, there is plenty of private space on board. But for others less fortunate, there were the annoyances of a roommate who spits tobacco in the morning and snores like a Newfoundland dog at night. In 1855, while the Great Britain and the Great Western are bridling the North Atlantic, Brunel begins his third and final ship, the Great Eastern. Built of iron and wood, it is in every way the incarnation of Brunel's flawed passion. Brunel had no business in shipping. He was a civil engineer, he was not a naval architect. But this wonderful sense of vision that the man had, he always could see how we could make things better. Why can't we sail around the world in 80 days? Why can't we do it? This remarkable model in Britain's National Maritime Museum showcases the construction of the Great Eastern. Her twin paddles are the size of Ferris wheels, her propeller as large as a windmill. 
Her 700-foot-long hull is held together by three million rivets. All around the model, the men are lowering the scaffolds, which were used to help construct the ship. Right in the middle is uh, Mr. Brunel himself, having his photograph taken, and all sorts of other details. Um, lots and lots of railway lines laid down there, which were then made slippery, and chains leading out from the hull out to buoys in the middle of the river, which would then be attached to steam winches so she could be hauled out. And then eventually, steam hydraulic rams would, would help to push her as well. Not only was she six times larger than any other ship of the day, but she was packed with innovations. I mean, she had a screw propeller and the side paddles. Uh, she was double skinned. She also had watertight bulkheads along her length. And yet, she still had sails. It was a long time before steamships eventually abandoned sails. On the Thames across from Greenwich are the remains of the launch timbers that supported the heaviest object ever made and moved by man. They're massive. They are huge. And yet, there was 18,000 tons of ships standing on top of them. The launch of the Great Eastern becomes Brunel's darkest nightmare. They started pushing, nothing happened. They pushed and they pushed, and suddenly, one end of the ship, zonk! The men on the winch handles had not removed the winch handle from the braking drum. The chains from the ship to the braking drum are pulled taut. The handle is wow! And these men are smashed to pieces by the handle. Roar from the crowd. End of launch. The Great Eastern tips over like a tub and cannot be moved for two months. There is a scorn and derision in the press. Brunel has to take all this. Lonely, people leave him now, people lose interest. And on his own, after weeks of shoving with these hydraulic jacks, they arrive at the water's edge. Just Brunel and his son and one or two helpers, a dark, cold, windy morning in January, and they're waiting for the tide to rise, and the tide laps up under the hull of the boat. And she lifts, she lifts, and they're in the water. A year later, disaster strikes again. Moments after visiting the ship, Brunel has a stroke. Eight days later, while recuperating at home, he learns the Great Eastern's boiler has exploded. Five men have been scalded to death. The news is more than he can bear. Shortly thereafter, he dies at the age of 53. The Great Eastern, capable of steaming 10,000 miles without stopping to refuel, never fulfills her potential. Her one mark of distinction comes in 1881, when she helps lay the Atlantic Cable. In the years ahead, others would build bigger, faster, and more elegant ships, but only because Brunel, that grandest of failures, once imagined the impossible. It is the QE2 second day at sea. She is 2,200 miles from New York. Her speed, 28 knots. At this rate, QE2's total travel time will be about 107 hours, berth to berth. The temperature on the North Atlantic is 56 degrees with a stiff, cool breeze. Very few brave the pool. Most prefer champagne and fine dining. The reason we're here is uh, to take people across the ocean. And unless we have people on board who want to go across the ocean, we don't get a seat. So then you have to look at who are the most important people on the ship. And uh, you can take one side and say, well, the waiter in the restaurant is the most important man in the ship because he has close contact with 24 people for six hours a day. And what he does and how he is makes them happy or unhappy.
Oddly enough, the idea of taking a great hotel to sea wasn't a British idea. It was the inspiration of a 19th century German shipping executive named Albert Ballin. Ballin lived in an era of unprecedented German artistic and scientific advances. In his time, the world's first airship was designed by Count Zeppelin. Wilhelm Röntgen invented the X-ray. Schumann and Mendelssohn were the composers of his generation. And all the while, Queen Victoria's grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was eager to challenge the British. He literally ordered the Hamburg American and North German Lloyd, we've got to show the English that we can do it. He'd been to the Naval Review of 1889 at Spithead, was completely overcome by the British supremacy, and said, we've got to have some of these too. And so the designers set to work to create bigger, faster, more tumultuous looking, and certainly stunningly decorated ships. Albert Ballon would make the Kaiser's dream come true. At 31, he is the managing director of the Hamburg American Line, or HAPAG, where they call him the Wunderkind. He invents a slogan for his company, My Field is the World. Ballin is full of brilliant ideas. The liner August Victoria of 1890, named for the Kaiser's wife, is an example of Ballin's innovation. He adds a second propeller to the ship and to the rest of the fleet. His simple idea ends distressing breakdowns at sea. But Ballin is best remembered for the beautiful architectural ideas he brought to his ships and for his attention to detail. The Ritz Hotel in London's Mayfair, as fashionable today as at the turn of the century. Inside is a world of elegance and luxury. The architectural ideas resplendent in the Ritz today mirror the ideas that Albert Ballon took to sea in 1850. To Ballon, a ship was like a hotel. It required rooms for different functions. A place to sit, to read, to eat, to sleep, to dance. He would use the most opulent materials to decorate his ships. Marbles from Italy, woods from Africa, even silver and gold. His passengers would dine at table set with gilded Louis XVI armchairs, recalling the comfort of Edwardian high life of which they were born. Above, vaulted ceilings and chandeliers, all set on an ocean liner for the first time. Inspired by the cuisine at the Carlton, Ballon hired its manager, Cesar Ritz, as head of food and service for his fleet. He also signed the architects who had created Ritz's great hotels, Charles Mevis and Arthur Davis, to design interiors exclusively for Hapag. Arthur Davis was once asked why he didn't want his ships to look remotely like a ship. And he said, I can assure you, when most of the passengers who travel on these boats are wealthy American ladies, often very frightened ladies, who the last thing they want to be reminded of is the sea. So I try and create a setting that will make them feel at home. Home for Ballon's first class passengers was very likely a place like this. The residence of diamond mogul Sir Julius Wernher, designed by Mevis and Davis in 1901. The interiors of this stately country home outside London might well have been the inspiration for the interiors of Ballon's greatest ships. Ships like Imperator and Vaterland. Those ships borrowed heavily from landed architectural ideas. For the first time, 
ships no longer resembled ships. There was enough gold and marble for Louis XVI. Enough plants for any naturalist. To attract the most wealthy and influential passengers, Balin's architects used quality stone, brass, and ironwork. So much, in fact, that one of his ships actually became top-heavy. One Mevison Davis hallmark was their skill in providing the grand entrance for elegantly dressed women. All staircases designed by them, the treads are always bigger as you get down to the bottom. It's a very theatrical sweep very precisely done, but it always works. Nervous was very keen that public rooms should have staircases or little, even shallow ones, because he said that he wanted all the great ladies in their beautiful dresses to have a theatrical entrance. Balin wanted to make every passenger feel like a king or queen. After all, a happy customer was good business. That business philosophy touched passengers in every class. He even provided meals for immigrants in steerage, because that too was good business. In Hamburg, he pioneered a unique village where immigrants were cared for as they waited for the ships to take them to America. Their $10 ticket included transportation from the rail station, food, water, a hot bath, and a bed. Berlin had some kind of a heart for the immigrants, and he built that village about 1910. About here, 5,000 people could be housed there at the same time. Berlin had other reasons for his village. In previous years, an outbreak of cholera compelled American immigration officials to return a boatload of contagious passengers at the company's expense. It cost a small fortune. Out of that financial disaster, the idea of the village emerged. Now Ballon could protect his investment, be assured that his passengers were healthy and would clear Ellis Island. Because of Ballin's business genius, the immigrant trade became a financial bonanza. Two-thirds of the company's revenue and half its profits came from steerage. Albert Ballin's floating palaces were magnificent, but their lowest decks were always filled with poor peasants, many of whom had spent their life savings for a new start across the sea. The story of the floating palaces is also their story. The QE2 has passed the midpoint of her journey to New York. Her 1,200 passengers are accommodated in four classes, from deluxe to economy. In years gone by, there was another class called steerage. It was in the bottom of the ship, with neither portholes for light nor ventilators for air. For all the hardships they would leave, a crossing in steerage was one last ordeal for the immigrant on his way to America. One QE2 passenger, Irene Stevens, recalls her father's crossing. In 1909, my father crossed this same ocean in steerage, where he told us that they were all together like in a huge dorm. Uh, there was no privacy. Um, he was trying to help a Hungarian lady who had four children who were very sick in the crossing. It was in November because he couldn't afford the more stable crossings in the summer. And uh, there were chamber pots and places where people were being ill. And they were only allowed up on the deck once a day for one walk around the deck.
The ride on the ocean was unbelievable. It was so scary. Those waves in the middle of the Atlantic, my God, you, you say to yourself, are we ever going to get to America? Steerage was one huge place. It was the lowest deck. The stench, it was, it was very hot, compounded by the... And the trip was very, very hard. The food was very bad. The accommodations, of course, they couldn't take a bath or anything like that. The tables had little edges on them so that dishes wouldn't fall, but it didn't keep them from sliding. And I can always recall soup going down one end of the table and getting this wonderful gentleman always immaculately dressed and here all this soup just went all over him. Men's room and for the first time I flushed a toilet and water started gushing and I ran because I was positive that I was drowning that boat. I never told anybody. From the 1840s forward, 17 million immigrants crossed the Atlantic. Much of Europe was in economic and political turmoil. Escape to America seemed the answer to many. From Eastern and Central Europe, they walked and rode trains to the German port cities of Hamburg and Bremerhaven. In England, they made their way to Liverpool. And from the tiny villages and crowded cities of Ireland, they came to Queenstown. Crowded into ships of the Hamburg American Line, Norddeutsche Lloyd, White Star, Inman, and Cunard, they endured much in search of a new life. They arrived in New York Harbor at a place called Ellis Island. Today, a new generation honors the sacrifices of the last. It brought back my father's memory. It made me feel very lucky. The hall is for tourists now. The immigrants are gone. Here is where they waited by the thousands were inspected for head lice, tuberculosis, trachoma, and insanity. Many a passenger who had cried their eyes red on the arduous crossing were mistakenly judged to have trachoma and sent back on the next boat with anyone else deemed unfit for America. You might characterize the levels of the ship as a kind of level of dream. Uh, the people on the upper decks had already achieved the dream. They had been to America, they had made their fortunes, uh, and they were capable of living this lifestyle. The ones below decks hadn't yet had the opportunity. That was the purpose of their trip. Their trip was to come and to essentially discover the American dream that their predecessors had already realized. In Ireland, the Great Famine of 1847 drove over two million people to join the westward migration. Today, in the harbor at Cove, the former Queenstown, in the shadow of St. Coleman's Cathedral, stands a statue of Annie Moore the first immigrant to register at Ellis Island. She was just 15 years old when she kissed her mother and father goodbye to board a steamer for New York from the old Queenstown Railway Terminal. It's now the Cove Heritage Center, where visitors can only imagine the experience of those who waited here to go to America. The people who emigrated from Cove were generally young. They were normally aged between about 15 and 25. They would be single normally. And uh, normally they would travel out though in, in family groups, perhaps with a brother or a sister or a friend from the same area. Most of them had little future in Ireland, so they were seeking their fortune abroad as it were. 
and as many women as men emigrated, which is quite interesting. Hardly a family was untouched. At the peak of the famine, thousands of young Irishmen sailed for America every month. Most would never see Ireland again. An American wake was held on the evening before the emigrant left. It went on all night. There would be plenty of drink, a um, certain amount of merrymaking, dancing, and it probably didn't seem that sad. Towards dawn, I think people would start to realize, yes, this, this person was going away. Relatives or friends perhaps would be starting to drift away and saying their goodbye. And the next morning then, the emigrant would get the train down to Queenstown. It was called an American wake because many of the emigrants never returned again. And so they would wake them the same way as they would wake the dead. Across the Irish Sea on England's west coast, the city of Liverpool was the gathering place for many an immigrant. Here at the Canard offices, they climbed these stairs to buy their tickets to America. The Canard offices still dominate the Liverpool skyline. Some nine million people passed through the port between 1830 and 1930. Um, in the early days on sailing vessels, in the later days, um, at the bottom of these great big floating palaces. They were actually built with these third class, these steerage areas right at the bottom of the vessels, which could carry thousands of people, many more people, travelled westwards in the bottom of those vessels than were travelling in comfort in first class at the top of the vessels. It was the steerage passengers that actually paid the profit to the companies. The emigrants had to, to wait here in Liverpool for their vessels. For the poor emigrants, um, DOS houses. For the third class, for those who had a little bit, possibly second class, there were a number of hotels put up by the shipping companies themselves. And then, of course, there was the top the Adelphi Hotel of today, um, built by the railways for its first-class passengers to await overnight the, uh, the departure of their boat. Unlike the immigrant house, the Adelphi is still open for business. Built in 1912, this was one of the great hotels of Europe. Today, its distinctive ship-like interiors remind us of what life was like in those days. One traveler remarked he enjoyed the Adelphi because he scarcely noticed whether he was on board the Aquitania or in his room in Liverpool. And so, what began as a business to deliver the mail had become a force for global change. The rivalry between Britain and Germany had made it possible for European immigrants to travel west to plant the seed of a new American generation. First thing you saw sticking out of the water was the top of the World War building. Oh, it was exciting. Everybody cheered, America! America, my God, everybody's yelling, crying. We dressed immediately and we ran down to the deck. And there were people of all denominations as we were passing the Statue of Liberty. 